going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 is our text for today. As we continue our Just Jesus series, we are uh, spending a year walking through the Gospel of Luke, looking at Jesus, at his encounters, at his experiences, the way he dealt with people, the things that he taught. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. They look just like this one. Turn to page 1000. 107, and you will find uh, Luke chapter 12, and you'll be able to follow along with our text today. And, uh, and if you don't have a Bible and you want to read God's Word, then please, by all means, take one of those with you. We want you to have God's Word and to read it, because we know if you do, it'll change your life. Hey, um, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, shameless self-promoting here, uh, just for a moment. Uh, next Saturday, the 18th, at 3.30 in the afternoon, we are offering our Intro to Calvary class. Uh, it's going to be right down the student wing hallway in the classroom right over here. <clears throat> and we offer that class every single month. It's just, uh, hey, what do you want to know about Calvary? It gives you an opportunity to ask questions. We talk about who we are, what we believe, why we do what we do, uh, and kind of how we operate as a church. And uh, like I said, we offer this every month. And why am I spending a little extra time promoting it? Because this Saturday, I get the privilege of teaching Intro to Calvary. And, uh, and I usually don't get to do that. I used to teach all of them way back in the day. But as we've gotten bigger, uh, I just don't get to teach that many. So about once every couple of years, I get that opportunity. And so um, if you've been thinking about going to that class, then put it on your calendar and show up Saturday afternoon. We'd love to have you. I'd love to have you hang out with me for a little bit because I love talking about what God is doing at this church. So what are you afraid of? What are those things, whether rational or irrational, that you feel? fear that kind of get under your skin or creep you out or whatever, uh, if you're sitting next to somebody that uh, you know well enough to talk to, then tell them what you're afraid of. One thing you're afraid of, if no one's sitting next to you, write it on your notes. Write down the one thing you're afraid of. Ready, set, go. You only have like 10 seconds to do this. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? All right, so I, I did a search, and I found the top nine fears worldwide. Uh, they interviewed people. This is not just America. This is not just our culture or our country. These are worldwide fears, top nine fears worldwide. Let's see which ones apply to you, okay? Uh, number nine is the fear of flying. Anybody afraid of flying? Yeah, a few of you are. Put your hands up there. You didn't fly here this morning. You drove. That's good. Uh, number eight is the fear of germs. We got any germaphobes in the room? Yeah, a few of you. We always can tell the germaphobes because they got that little, you know, hand sanitizer on their belt, you know, <laughs> offering it to everybody. You need some hand sanitizer? Uh, it's good to travel with somebody like that. Uh, how about small spaces? Number seven is claustrophobia. Any, anyone claustrophobic? Yeah, I got you. I found out that my wife was claustrophobic the first and last time I took her camping. Uh, it was not fun. Number six, a little bit surprising to me, I don't know about to you, but number six is thunder and lightning. Anybody afraid of storms out there? Okay, see some hands up there. All right. Number five shocked me. I'll just be honest. Never even occurred to me it'd be on the list. Number five is fear of dogs. Fear of dogs. Okay, we got some people who are afraid of dogs out there. Okay, number four, <laughs> it'd be interesting if you're here in this one, uh, fear of crowds. Anybody here afraid of crowds? Actually, some people are. Okay, well, I appreciate the fact that you brave the crowds to be here. Usually they're sitting toward the back by the exits. Uh, that's all right. Okay, now we get to the serious ones. Top three here. Number three is the fear of heights. Anybody afraid of heights? Yeah, every service, lots of people afraid of heights. Number two is the fear of snakes. Yeah, lots of people afraid of snakes. We're, we're kind of like the world. Number one fear worldwide, can't be that much far ahead of number two, but is the fear of spiders. Yeah, anybody like, I think spiders are creepier than snakes because, you, you know, they sneak up on you. So, well, today we're continuing to talk about the battle, the battle that we have as followers of Jesus Christ, and we're talking about the battle of fear, the battle with fear. And uh, Jesus speaks into our lives talking about fear. Now, before we dive into what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, understand that Satan pretty much has two weapons in his arsenal when he deals with us, when he attacks us. Those weapons are lies, because he's the father of lies, and fear. He is the champion of fear. So anytime you're looking at a decision and you make a decision based out of fear, then that's probably not the right decision. It's definitely not making it the right way. Because Jesus declares, do not fear. Do not fear. Luke chapter 12, short passage beginning in verse 4. Jesus says, I tell you, my friends, 
do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he is killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus says, don't fear. Now, um, that is consistent with what, all of what Scripture says. If you read the Bible from beginning to end, it's kind of important that you notice the things that are repeated by God over and over and over again through the pages of Scripture. And one of those things that's repeated uh, many times, in fact, over 300 times in the Bible, is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God doesn't want us to fear. And Jesus says, don't fear. And then he goes right for the big fear, right? Death. Don't fear people who can only kill you. Say what, Jesus? Don't fear people who can only kill us. Isn't that what he said, verse 4? I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more they can do. Jesus says, don't fear people who can only kill you. Okay, that's really simple. Jesus said it so everyone feels better right now, right? We're not afraid anymore. We just go home. No. No, it's, it, in fact, it's kind of crazy if you think about it. Don't fear those who can only kill you. What is, why does Jesus say this? What does he want us to get? Think about it. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then what Jesus is saying is you don't have to be afraid of people who can only kill you because you know your sins are forgiven. You know that heaven is your destination. So if the worst possible thing that, that they could do is kill you, then the worst possible thing that could happen to you is that you get to go to heaven before you thought you wanted to be there. Right? I mean, because we all want to go to heaven someday. We just don't want to go right now. So if somebody were to actually step in and kill you, you might not be happy about how you get there, but suddenly you're going to find yourself in heaven and you're not going to be upset about anything because you're where you wanted to be and you just thought you wanted to get there later until you get there. So Jesus says, don't be afraid of them. All they can do is send you to heaven. Now what about some of the other fears that plague us? What about the fear of failure? How do we approach that? Well, with the fact that God redeems, he promises to take all of our mistakes, all of our brokenness, and put it together in a beautiful way. You see, to God, success is all about character. It's not about our public accomplishments and accolades that we achieve. He wants you to be that person, and he's developing your character. So you don't have to fear failure. You don't have to fear rejection or that, that whole relationship breakup thing, the loneliness stuff that's part of it, because God has said, look, I will accept you. Everyone who calls on my name is part of my family. And I'll adopt you as a son or a daughter. I'll, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You'll never be lonely again. I'm going to be with you always. Okay, what about that fear of, of ridicule and humiliation? Well, God is the one who approves us. God is the one who judges us. And God is the one who defends us. In fact, Scripture says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble, humiliation, same root word. God wants to, to be there for you. So Jesus says, do not fear because fear inhibits freedom. Fear inhibits freedom. And by the way, when it inhibits our freedom, it steals our joy. And I don't know if you paid attention to this or not, but one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy and peace. And when we're afraid, we don't have that. So fear wants to enslave us, to haunt us, to paralyze us. The Apostle Paul put it this way. He said, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And that's what fear becomes when we let it dominate our lives. I, I know this personally. I was about 12, 13 years old, and, and uh, I got to float down the Salt River outside of Phoenix. I don't know if any of you have ever done that. It used to be a kind of a wild experience. Now it's way more controlled. And we were going down with a group, and we stopped at this place where there was a cliff, and people were going up there jumping off, and somebody said, hey, let's go jump off the cliff. And I was like, yeah, let's go jump off the cliff. And I got to the edge of the cliff, and I chickened out. 
I just chickened out. I couldn't do it. I was like, I can't do it. And I climbed back down, hung my head in shame, went back to my tube and finished floating down. And I was haunted by that fear. That fear that paralyzed me for those moments on that cliff stuck with me and accused me for the, for the next year or two of being a coward. See, fear inhibits our freedom. And fear cripples our influence for Christ. Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. That's why we do what we do. We want to lead people to Jesus Christ. This is why we are not doom and gloom people. This is why we won't lament about how terrible everything is. And yes, when you look at the world, there's a lot of terrible stuff going on. There, there's, there's hatred, there's violence, there's a tragedy that happened in Orlando last night. There's terrorism across the ocean. There's the economy. There's the, the, the direction our nation is going away from God. And, and yet all of that is happening. And yet Jesus still says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So we're not going to lament about how bad the world is because let's just be honest about this. We've got it pretty good. Right? I mean, anybody starving to death in, in this room? Because we'll feed you after the service if you are. Yeah, we've got places to sleep. We've, we've got a comfortable place to come and worship. We've got air conditioning. You know? And so, you know, things are pretty good for us. So, so why would we lament about how terrible everything is? See, here's, here's the reality. If, if we live fear-filled lives, it's difficult to convince people that Jesus sets us free and gives us joy and peace. So we don't want to live fear-filled lives. We don't want to lament. We don't want to yeah, be doom and gloom. We don't want to just hunker down and hang on until Jesus comes and talk about how bad it is. We want to live powerfully for Christ. Put it another way, Chicken Little doesn't inspire people to great things. So Jesus says, do not fear, with one exception. The one exception is this. He does say, fear God. Fear God. Verse 5, he's very clear about this. He says, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Fear God. God. And some of you are going, what? We're supposed to fear God? I thought God loves us, and he sent Jesus into this world to die for us and save us from our sins. Why in the world should I fear Jesus? Why would I fear God? Why would I do that? Does he really want us to fear him? Yes. Because fearing God leads us to be fearless. Fearing God leads us to be fearless. You want to live a life without fear? The journey begins at the point of beginning to fear God. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Or it might have the word knowledge or understanding. It doesn't matter. If you want to figure the world out and live fearlessly, fearing God is at the beginning point of understanding the world and how it works and how it's going to lay out so that you don't have to be afraid. Um, let me talk about what, uh, what I would call the faith progression. The faith progression. Um, this is how I understand the whole fear God thing. And let me explain how I understand it. See if it makes sense to you. And see where you are on this journey of faith. It begins when we understand that fearing God leads to obeying God. Fearing God leads to obeying God. When we understand who God is and how powerful God is, and that he's the creator of everything, and that he is the one who holds the keys to eternal life and eternal punishment, then we are motivated to obey. Um, it's kind of like this. I grew up in the day and age when you could actually publicly discipline your kids. And it wasn't even just your parents. It was other people who could discipline your kids too, like at school. They could, you know, get, give you swats and stuff. And, and I knew this. Uh, if I got in trouble at school, when I went home, I was going to get in more trouble from my parents. I mean, if I got swats at school, I didn't go home and tell my parents, they gave me swats because they were going to give me more. So I kept my nose clean at school because I didn't want to face the wrath of mom and dad. And I didn't get in trouble out in public because I didn't want to, you know, I wasn't afraid of the police. I was afraid of my parents when the police gave, them over, gave me over to them. You see, that was reality because I knew that my parents loved me, but I knew that they would hurt me. 
Okay, that, that's just reality of, of how I grew up. And you might not like that, but that's how I grew up. And so get this, I was motivated to obey because I didn't want to face the consequences that my parents represented. They, I knew they loved me, but I also knew that, that there was discipline involved and, and we're children of God by faith and he loves us, but he wants to correct us. It's kind of like this. Uh, anybody remember Dennis the Menace? Cartoons? Okay. I grew up reading Dennis Menace, and uh, if you don't know who Dennis Menace is, he's a perpetual five-year-old kid, kindergartner, who, who is living his life uh, as a menace, and, uh, and he's explaining to his little friend Joey, who's four years old, because, you know, Dennis knows everything, and Joey's learning from him, how the world works. And he says, Joey, we obey our parents because they are bigger and smarter than us. Mostly bigger. <laughs> and you think about that. There's a lot of wisdom in that. When we understand who God is, that he is always going to be bigger and smarter than us, then we obey him. Fearing God leads to obeying God, and then obeying God leads to knowing God. You see, we, we obey God, and we start living a wisdom-filled life. We begin to see and experience God's blessings, because when we obey God, when we live life his way, then his blessings flood into our life. And so we start practicing what God tells us to do in Scripture, and, and we start, you know, being patient and kind with people, because love is patient and love is kind. We're supposed to love our neighbor. And, and we start seeing that, that come back to us. And, and we start serving people, and we start feeling a sense of joy in that and accomplishment because God smiles on us. And, and we start obeying, and, and we go, wow, this stuff really works. And we begin to grasp that God really does tell us that you reap what you sow. And we begin to understand the, the mind of God. We begin to know that God's laws are an extension of his love. That his laws are designed not to, you know, deprive us, but to protect us. Because he loves us. And we begin to understand that God doesn't want to harm us. He wants to bless us. And we go, oh, okay, I get that, God. And so obeying God leads to trusting God and then, or to knowing God. And then knowing God leads to trusting God. Knowing God leads to trusting. So the better we know God, then the more we're going to trust him. So now I've been, I've been obeying God and I'm knowing God, so now I'm certain that God is for me. I know he loves me. I know he's going to bless me. I know his promises are true because I've lived them out. He, I know he's, he's going to protect me, so I'm going to trust him more. I'm going to trust him with, the, with obedience at the hard points. You know, because usually we start obe obeying at the easy stuff. I'm going to trust him at the hard points. You know, like... Um, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I'm going to try to do that now because I, I know God and I'm going to trust him that, that his word is true. I'm going to forgive those people who've really hurt me even though I don't want to because I understand now that forgiveness is for me and it lets me to, uh, when I forgive, it cleanses out that anger and that hatred and that bitterness that's in my soul and allows me to live with joy. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to trust God with my family. You know, I, I really want to, you know, I, I, my natural tendency is try to control my kids and control what's going on in my life. And instead of control, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise them to not be afraid. I'm going to raise them to love God, and, and I'm going to turn them loose to serve God. Right now, both in Albania and in Idaho, we've got teenagers that are serving God and representing Christ in places they've never been before. And I commend the parents who sent their kids. I just commend that. That is tremendous faith, and it's, an, it's honoring to God to do that. Uh, and and we, we start deciding that we're going to trust God with our money. Because that's a big point for a lot of people. We say, hey, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with my money, even though I don't understand how this whole tithing thing works. But you say you want 10%. I'm going to, I'm just going to, I don't have the money, but I'm going to give it to you because I trust you. And, and I know that you're going to take care of me. And they begin to see that God blesses them even more and, and takes care of their needs. And it all works out. And, and we trust God with our decisions that we're going to allow God to direct our life. Through his word. We, we trust God with the outcomes. We believe that God's going to work for our good even when we don't see how. We don't panic when things don't go the way we want. And by the way, things are never going to go the way you want them to. God's at work, but it's not going to work out on your time. It's not going to work out your way. Uh, and, and when we get to that point where we know God well enough to trust him, we're okay with that. We're like, okay, God, I don't see how you're working, but I know you are, and I'm going to believe in that, and I'm going to trust you. And as I grow in my trust of God, trusting God leads to a fearless life. It leads to a bold life of love and joy, of creative freedom, a life of purpose and influence for Jesus. 
Because when you truly grasp that the worst thing that can happen to you in this world is you getting to heaven a little bit early, it frees us to live fearlessly. So this morning, where are you in that faith progression? Do you fear God enough to obey Him? Are you obeying God enough to discover His goodness in your life? Do you know God enough to trust Him? And is your trust in God defeating your fears? Do not fear anyone or anything but the living God. And when you do that, you will find peace and hope and love that overflows in your life. And in fact, there'll be so much in your life, it'll spill out on the people that you love, and it'll bless them as well. Finally, let's discuss winning the battle with fear. We're in the battle. We're talking about fear. We're talking about how it works. Now let's talk about winning the battle. And I should say battles because it's an ongoing struggle that we're going to face because all of us face this battle with fears. Now, before I talk about how we win the battle with fear, let me just acknowledge something. Um, there are many in this room who struggle with anxiety and depression. And maybe you're under medical treatment for that. Maybe you're seeing a counselor for that. That is all well and good. I am not suggesting that my sermon is going to fix everything and you need to get rid of your treatment and your meds. What I'm going to suggest is that you take what I'm sharing and you add it to your regimen. Because here's the thing. I know there's a spiritual battle going on, but I also know there's a physical reality. And, and uh, that physical reality may be that you have chemicals in your brain that are not, you know, in the balance they're supposed to be. That's because we live in a broken world that's full of sin. And just as somebody who has diabetes needs to take insulin and somebody who has high blood pressure needs to take meds for that, if you need to take meds, then take them. It's not a demonstration that you don't have faith in God if you're in that place. Uh, so just know that. There's a spiritual battle. There's a physical reality uh, because of uh, the way our bodies are. And we want to win the battle with fear. How do we do that? It begins by acknowledging our fears. Acknowledging our fears. Uh, truth is always necessary to victory over fear. And self-honesty is critical. We've got to be honest with ourselves. So what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of the, the unknown? You know, the unknown is manifest in a lot of different ways. It's, it's manifest by fear of the future. What is going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen with the world? What's going to happen with the economy? What's going to happen with all these diseases? What's going to take place? I want to know these things, which is why people disobey God and they pursue knowledge of the future, right? You know, fortune tellers and palm readers and tarot cards and, and astrology, all that kind of stuff is trying to figure out the future. God says, don't worry about the future. Trust me. I'll be with you. I'll take care of you. It's going to be okay. But we've got to acknowledge our fears. Are you afraid of the future, the unknown? Are you afraid of the unknown as it's manifest in darkness? Anybody afraid of the dark? See, I don't want to raise your hand. Some of the kids are like, yeah. Hey, I was afraid of the dark. Uh, I slept with a light on until I was nine years old. Because if you're um, blessed and cursed with a vivid imagination, you can see what's in the dark. You know what I'm saying? That was me. I just, I was a kid, man. I could imagine all the monsters in the dark. I just be honest, I still get creeped out. You, know, you guys like this when you're home alone. If somebody's there, it's never a problem, but you're home alone and, and uh, you're getting ready to wash your face, it's like the scariest time ever. Because you're washing your face and you're going to look up in the mirror and you're thinking there's going to be somebody behind you like, eh, 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 eh. I don't know, it still creeps me out. And I'm not afraid, but I, you know, the thoughts pop into my head. You know, are you afraid of the unknown? Are you afraid of discovery? Are you afraid that people are going to find out about the real you? Who you really are, what you're really like? And then they're going to reject you and judge you? You see, confession is the antidote to that fear. It, it'll kill that fear immediately and set you free. See, Calvary is a confession place. We're not afraid of who you are, who you were, uh, because we know that God has the power to change your life. And the truth is, Scripture says that all of us are sinners and, and fall short of the glory of God, which means that we're all messed up. And, and so uh, we don't want you to waste energy trying to pretend that you're something that you're not. We just want you to be honest about the struggles, and that way we can pray for you and help you along the journey that we're on and becoming the people that God called us to be. You don't have to be afraid of that. Or maybe you're just afraid of looking foolish in front of people. Hopefully I and our ministry staff put you at ease each week with that. 
You see, uh, what are you afraid of? My fear, honestly, the one that has haunted me and probably will until the day I die is the fear of failure. Um, it's always nipping at my heels, telling me to play it safe and don't screw up. And yet God calls me to trust him and, and to go into places that are, that are risky and, and uh, to do new things and to build new buildings and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and so I've got to fight that battle all the time. What are you afraid of? You've got to acknowledge your fear if you want to win the battle with fear. And then you've got to confront your fear. Refuse to let it own you. Refuse to let it define you or to limit your life. Um, I told you how fear paralyzed me and haunted me when I was, you know, 12 or 13 at the river. And so what I did is the next time I went tubing down the Salt River, we came to a place where you could jump, and, and I had already decided I'm going to jump. It doesn't matter if I die doing it, I'm going to jump. And I climbed up there, and, uh, and I jumped. Now, was I afraid? Absolutely. You bet I was afraid. But I was going to beat fear by confronting it. And I did. I, I triumphed over fear that day. And throughout my life, when I came to places, in, you know, out on the lake or whatever, where there were people jumping off of cliffs, I jumped. Not necessarily because I wasn't afraid. I was still afraid. But because I wanted to defeat fear, and I wanted to remind fear that it didn't own me, and it wasn't going to define me. You see, confronting won't make the fear stop. It just makes it powerless to limit your life. I, I've seen people who are afraid of flying. They just didn't want to get on an airplane at any time. But they loved their children and their grandchildren who lived in other parts of the country. And so they confronted their fear of flying and did it anyway. I, I know a young lady who is what I would call medically terrified. She sees needles, talks about, you talk about medical stuff, she'll get sick, pass out, go, freak out. And yet because she felt called to go on a short-term mission trip where she had to get, you know, inoculations against diseases, she went ahead and did it. And I watched her because I was at the clinic where she walked in, broke down, and, and just sobbing hysterically while they gave her shots. She was still afraid, but she confronted the fear. The fear didn't limit or define her life. Now, you might need help with this step because most fears are a little bit more complicated. So talk with a pastor. Let the prayer team pray for you at the end of the service. Attend Celebrate Recovery. Make an appointment with a counselor. We've got several that we partner with as a church. Just don't let fear own you. You see, fear has the most power when we keep it secret. So acknowledge your fear, confront your fear, and decide to trust God. Decide to trust God. This is active faith. This is saying, God, you know I'm afraid, but I've chosen to trust you with my fear. And, and pray that. Let, let that be your prayer. God, uh, you, for me, you know I'm afraid of failure, and, and I'm, uh, I want to trust you with that, with my life, with my career, with my success. And so I'm going to follow you even when I'm afraid. And I just want you to know that. I want you to give me the strength to do it. That's a prayer of active faith. You step into that prayer, and you pray that, and ask God to help you, and then remind yourself of his presence. Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He is not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. You're not going to ever be alone. He's going to be with you. Thank God for his presence with you. And then remind yourself of God's provision. Because God has promised to protect us. He's promised to provide for us, to lead us, to heal us, to redeem our lives. So thank God for the good things he has given you. Because when you thank God for the blessings that he's given you, it reminds you that as he's blessed you in the past, he's going to bless you in the future. And it calms our fears because we're thanking God for his provision. And then remember God's promise. God's promise. Um, my favorite way of remembering God's promise is found in John chapter 14, when Jesus says this, Let not your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me, that where I am, you will always be. 
It's the promise of heaven. It's the promise of eternal life. It's the promise that, that Jesus said, look, I know you, and I've adopted you, and I'm going to come and take you to be with me in a, to a place that I've gotten ready for you. So thank God for that promise, and thank God that this world is just the preview. Uh, anyone ever go to the movies? You guys go to the movies? Why do you go to the movies? Because you want to go see the movie, right? You do not go to the movie to overpay for popcorn and soda, right? I mean, you might like going to the movies and getting popcorn and soda, but you don't really delight in paying too much money for the popcorn and soda. So you're there at the movies, and if you're somebody who actually arrives on time, then they have this thing before the movie that they call previews, right? You guys see the previews? You there for that? Okay, the previews. Now, if you don't like the previews, and by the way, the previews are just, they're just trying to sell you on another movie, so, or a commercial. So you get there, and, and you're looking at the previews. If you don't like the preview, do you leave? <laughs> no, you don't leave because you don't like the previews. You just go, oh, that's a bad movie. I'm not going to go see it. My daughter, if it's a scary movie preview, she just closes her eyes. Doesn't want to see it. Okay, if you don't like the, the movie, if you don't like the previews, you don't get up and leave because you came for the main attraction. Guys, we're living in the previews. We're just here for a moment compared to eternity. Eternity is the main attraction. So, um, if you don't like life right now, if it's painful, if it's sorrowful, uh, if it's uh, not what you were hoping it would be, then understand the main attraction is still to come. Hold on to that hope. Live in God's promise. Live fearlessly. Because Jesus calls us to not be afraid. I pray today that you can live a fearless life. Will you pray with me?